Hello and welcome to the Art Companion for lecture number 10. We're going to look at an example that's found in the book, uh, chapter 10, section 4.1, Factorial Experiments in a Randomized Block Design. And the example we're going to look at is example 9.6, and specifically how to get all the information in table 10.9. So let's begin. New script. And of course, the first thing we need to do is to import the data. Always need to import the data. Can't do anything without data. So, since I planned ahead, um, here's the data. Notice this data actually comes from table 9.16 on page 504. And I went through and I double checked that I got everything right. And in fact, I used the C bind, uh, time, heat, Machine length. Oops. <laughs> Heat. There we go. And I looked at the, this is the output from that C bind command. And I went back over table 916 just to double check that I got everything in correctly. It took a while, but it's what you got to do if you care. Um, notice I did not do the as factor yet, because once you do the as factor, um, these values, the 8 o'clock, the w's, the b's, etc., are going to be changed into 1's, 2's, 3's, and 4's. So I'll do the as factor now. And just to drive that point home, I'm going to rerun that C bind line. Now we've got 1's, 3's, 2's, 4's, etc. So what the as factor does is actually just takes these string values, these categorical values, and translates them into integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then in the lookup table at some point, um, they're able to match, R is able to match what a 1 actually indicates. A 1 indicates here, 1 indicates probably eight o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock, and a 3 indicates 8 o'clock. But a 1 in, for this variable, the heat variable, um, represents an L, and a 4 for the third variable, which is machine, uh, represents a D. It actually saves um, memory for R to do that. And since it saves memory, it's also going to speed things up. So let's test the model, and that's that first part of table 9, uh, table 10.9. That first three lines is just testing the model, seeing if if there is any random variation in the model that's unexplained by just simple randomness. And again, it follows the same methods. We got to do an interaction, time, heat, and machine in this case, and then we do our initial model with the dependent variable, squiggle that interaction, that full interaction, and then do a summary of it. And we see that the p-value is 2.02 times 10 to the negative 6, which is less than alpha. Therefore, there is variation that's unexplained by just that simple variation. If you want to see all those levels that we create with the end full, uh, summary.lm will do that. So this 4.75 is the 8 o'clock by w by D. And I actually don't recall what W, D, and I know what 8 o'clock means, but, and it is significantly different from the base level. So that's one thing that summary.lm does. Now that takes care of that first part. Notice the degrees of freedom is 23 and 72, and we add those together to get the corrected total, which is 95. Sums of squares also add to give the corrected total. Uh, mean squares do not add. And there's the f value, and there's the corresponding p value. So now let's work on the middle part, the not the r squared line. How would we get the r squared? None of you have asked me that yet, or maybe you will have by the time you get to this. But if we do summary.lm, we actually get the r squared part. 5688. Uh, 0.5688. Also note that we get this p value is exactly the same, scrolling up, as this p value. 
So that summary.lm actually gives us some good information. Uh, let's go ahead and keep that there then. .lm. OK, so let's go to the middle part. The part that starts with source, machine, time, heat. Well, let's go ahead and build up the, I'll call this the middle part. So we'll call this mod2. And this is going to be also AOV. And then just to make it easy for us to compare what we get on our computer with that table, we'll do it in that order. So it's going to start with machine, or I'm sorry, length, uh, machine, and then plus time, plus heat, plus. Now notice that it's time times heat. In R, in a formula, it's going to be a colon. And again, in the formula, that's going to be a colon. A star in a formula, an asterisk in a formula, means something different. Um, then time, heat, machine. So what this will do is it will create a model and fit the model for the independent variables. There are five of them. There's machine, there's time, there's heat, there's time times heat, and there's time times heat times machine. Then all we need is to do a summary. And let's see what we get. There's the output. Just look down the, the middle part of the table. 3, 2, 1, 2, 15. And then those add up to 72. Notice this 72 is exactly the same. I can control my mouse. Can you? Is exactly the same as this 72, because the residuals are the same in both cases. This int full contains all the information that's here, and the residuals is all that's left. So if we were to add up the 82.3, the 1.6, the 100, the 12.9, the 393.4, we'd get the 590.3. And if we add up the 15, the 2, the 1, the 2, and the 3, we will get 23. So in other words, this new model, this model 2, breaks out a lot of that variation that was held within that int full variable. And notice we've got the ANOVA, sum of the squares, the mean squares, the F values, and the P values. Also note that these F values and P values are wrong. These F values and P values are based on your error term being the residuals. But as the book explains, in this case, the error terms are not the residuals. The error terms really are the machine by time by heat. So that bottom part of the table is just essentially dividing these mean squares for machine, for time, and for time by heat by the mean squared for machine by time by heat, and then calculating those p-values, which is what we do here. And again, I'm going to create a variable to hold that ANOVA table. I'm remembering the double brackets. So I run that, and now the ANOVA table is that and we can access every single number that's in this table. And we're going to need to because we got we need this error term mean square. So we'll call this error term. That's going to equal the ANOVA table of 5, comma 3. And it's 5, comma 3 because it's row 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, column 3, 1, 2, 3. These are just labels, so they're not really numbers in the table. And these things along the top are just labels. They're not numbers in the table. Just to double check, and I always encourage you to double check that you got the right value. Go ahead and run that. 5.4888. Yep, that's what we got. So this error term is now the denominator for the correct F values and which lead to those correct p-values. So the correct f-value for heat 
It's just going to be, let's see, it's going to be the mean squared for heat, which is this value, which is row 1, 2, row 3, column 3, divided by that er error term. Now let's double check. It's 18.2262, and that matches the F value in the table. So the F value for time is just going to be the AOV table of that time mean square, row 2, column 3, divided by the error term, 1.174722. Well, the book only gives us 1.17, so you'll have to trust me. And then the F value um, for the uh, Interaction of time and heat. Time by heat equals, that's your AOV table. And where is that interaction term of time? One, two, three, fourth row, and again, third column. So there's your 0 0.1499241, which rounded to decimal places 0.15. So that's how you get those F values. And they come about because you're supposed to use the machine by time by heat as your error term and not the residuals. And the book explains why. So the last step is to turn these F values into P values. And here's how you do it. It's P, F. P stands for cumulative probability, and F is the distribution. And we know that an F statistic follows an F distribution. First thing that takes is the value. Then you've got to give it its two degrees of freedom. DF1 is the numerator degrees of freedom, which for heat is 1. And DF2 is the denominator degrees of freedom, which is this 15, not the 72, the 15, because now the machine by time by heat is your error term. And then we specify that we do not want the lower tail. There's our p-value. What would happen if we wanted the lower tail? If we left that part off, you'll get 1 minus the p-value that we actually want. So you could also do this and that'll give us the correct p-value. So the p-value for the f time, uh, df1 is equal to, let's see, time has two degrees of freedom. df2 is still 15. So there's our p-value of 0 0.3357707, round to 4 is 0 0.3358. And then the last one is, again, it's um, F of time by heat. The F1 is equal to time by heat, degrees of freedom numerator are 2. The F2 is still 15. And the lower tail still is going to be false. 86204 matches the table. Now, at this point, you may be asking, well, wait a minute. Why, there we got everything lined up nicely. Why did you hard code the degrees of freedoms instead of having variables for those? And the answer is, well, because I did. Um, I did want to code in the F values because I wanted to show you from a pedagogical standpoint how we get those. Um, but at this point, I'm just pulling off numbers from the ANOVA table. And I really don't need to. Um, I really don't need to code that in, other than just the numbers themselves, because it's pretty easy to figure out where the 15 came from when it corresponds to F heat. I mean, there's only one 15 for degrees of freedom in there. We could. Um, that degrees of freedom there. Degrees of freedom for heat would be ANOVA table. Heat is 3, and degrees of freedom is 1. And this would be um, 
one, two, three, four, five, comma one. And we could do it that way. We get the same values. And it would be beneficial to do this if you realize, oh, wait a minute, I made a mistake way up here, and then rerunning the whole thing would just take two seconds. But if you hard coded them in, these numbers may actually change. So it's completely up to you. Um, for the f time, and one, two would be two comma one. And for the f time by heat, it's four comma one. And these are all five ones. And those give the exact same values. So we could have done it that way. But that's an R programming issue, and, and feel free to do it whichever way you want. Um, I really do strongly suggest that you put in more comments than I've put in here, um, just so that you know what's going on when you come back to this five years later or one week later. Because it's a lot easier to look at the script with comments than it is to rerun this entire video. Um, even though I know you're totally in love with the sound of my voice, um, if you can stay awake. Um, that was sarcasm in case you can't tell. So anyway, there, that was the goal for this, table 10.9, and how we did the factorial treatment structure in a randomized complete block design. And again, it's, the tools are the same that we've been using, we're just using them in different ways. So take care, and thank you very much.